to Cascade Hills Church this morning. So glad to see you. I also want to welcome the people that are watching online, our online family. We're so glad that you're tuning in. We realize that every single week there are people that move and relocate, and many of them relocate to places where they don't have a church like Cascade Hills. And so through means of technology, we continue to minister to you and continue to send in your prayer requests, and we'll pray for those. But we love and appreciate every single one of you. Well, today uh, we're going to jump into a new topic, just a one-off. Uh, last week, if you remember, we talked about who the Holy Spirit is and the power uh, that we have in Him. If you missed last week's message, I would highly encourage you to go back and check it out on our app or on the web. Uh, it's even more important as today's message. I mean, as, as much as I'd like to say today is more important, it's not. Last week, last week is the most powerful message that you can hear concerning the Holy Spirit. As we talked about last week, we talked about that that is the secret to success in your spiritual life. And so check that out. But rolling off of last week, you remember we talked about from John 13 to John 16? Well, here there's a little verse in there that we skipped over last week that I'd like to springboard off of into this week. Here's the verse, John 14, 27. It says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. Now, I want to talk to you for just a few moments today about what I believe to be the ultimate peace killer, the ultimate joy stiller, and that is the issue of worry. Every single one of us have worries. Every single one of us at one point in our life, we've worried. We worry about things in the past. We worry about things in the, in the present. And worry steals a lot of things from us. I believe that many of you came here today and you've got a worry on your mind. You've had it on your mind all week, perhaps all month, perhaps for months and months and months. And maybe just maybe you came today saying, if I could just get some relief for an hour, I'd be fine. But it's been tormenting my mind because I'm worried about how this deal is going to work out or how this kid's going to turn out or how this deal is going to play out when it's all said and done. And maybe today will be the thing that you need to hear. Now, when we talk about worry, they generally fall within these categories, okay? And all of them start with F because that's just the Baptist preacher's kid in me, okay? So we've got failure. We worry about that. We worry, have I failed to be the father I need to be? Have I failed to be the mother that I should be? Have I failed to be the, the worker that I need to be? And we worry about that. We worry about our future, don't we? How are things going to pan out? Is this kid going to turn out to be an angel or tracking to be a demon, okay? I mean, how's this baby gonna turn out? I just don't know. Uh, how's my future gonna turn out? Am I gonna be able to afford that? Am I gonna be able to get into that college? Am I gonna be able to find that person I can marry? And we worry about it. We worry about our fitness. We worry about our health, don't we? We worry about the doctor's reports that we've gotten that don't look so good. We worry about the report we haven't yet got yet. We worry about our health. We worry about our family, how they're gonna turn out and the issues that they may be struggling with. We worry about our fashion. When I, mean, when I talk about that, I mean we worry about buying, you know, the, the clothes for the kids. They won't stop growing. And I wish they'd be more like Pastor Brent and they'd be the same size since fifth grade and just wear the same clothes. And we worry about that stuff. Uh, we worry about our finances. That's the number one worry, I believe, on the list is finances. How do we make ends work? Am I going to be able to pay this debt off? You know, will I get the raise? Will I get the promotion? So we worry about all these different areas, and most of them fit within these categories here. And when I talk about that, I want us to set the stage here for a moment, and I want us to write down in just a moment. So go ahead and grab your piece of paper or your, your iPhone. You can text message yourself if you're, if you're into that. Uh, sometimes I do that when I'm feeling lonely. I'll just text myself and say, I love you. And, and anyways... <laughs> You can write it down however, however you want, uh, but right in just a moment, I'm going to give you 30 seconds, and I want you to write down the top three things that you are currently worried about in, in just a moment. And the reason I want to do this is because there's an old quote that I, I believe to be true. It says, I hear and I forget. I see, I remember, I do, and I understand. So I want us to apply this message today. So guys, if you wouldn't mind, put 30 seconds on the clock. And 30 seconds for the people watching online. And let's, uh, let's take 30 seconds and write the top three worries in your life. Let's go. How creative. If you're in the house, they're playing Bob Marley, don't worry about a thing. Now, I don't mean to stress you out, but you've got 15 seconds to write the thing. So don't worry, but kind of speed it up. You got nine seconds, the top three things in your life that you are worried about. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, I know copyright deals, you probably can't hear it online, but that was Bob Marley. Don't worry about a thing. And if you know Bob Marley, you probably know why he wasn't worried about a thing. 
Um, anyways, but have you ever gotten these people, like I saw a few of you out there, that uh, they really just don't worry. Like I saw some people writing like a book in 30 seconds, the things you're worried about. You, you could go way past three. But yet there's a few of you that are like, eh, I'm good. Not much to worry about. It will be all right. And I admire that. I really do, because I'm type A. I gotta, I'm a bit of a control freak. I gotta make sure I plan things and do things my way. And that's just the way I'm, I'm kind of hardwired, just a, a fast goer. But yeah, there's people that just, they just don't worry. And it's not that they don't care. There's some people that that's the issue, but some of these people that I'm talking about, it's not that they don't care, they just don't worry. They just figure it will be all right. It'll be fine. And that's what Jesus teaches. He teaches really an anxiety-free life, that we should have an anxiety-free life. And if I'm honest, I admire that. But then there's also a part of me that gets on my nerves. Like, I, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm stressed out, and here you are just not worried about a thing. It's going to be all right. I've told, told you before about that's my wife. My wife, Carrie Beth, she just doesn't worry. She's a woman of faith. She's, she doesn't worry. And I, I admire it, but yet it gets on my nerves. I've told you the story about the time we were going to take a two-day trip going to Charlotte, North Carolina. And you know, when you have little kids, two days is like an eternity. I mean, I, she put it on the calendar. She said, Brent, you've got a slot here for two days. I'm gonna take care of the tickets and we'll take care of the, I'm gonna plan it all, okay? You just show up and, you, and we're gonna get away. And I said, that sounds wonderful. Let's, I'm, I was looking forward to it. And then we get to running late to the airport that day. I'm so excited that we're running late. And you know, for type A people, we don't like airports. I mean, you hurry up to wait. It's just a stressful thing. You know, you got to get your baggage. You got to do the whole deal. It's just, it's not good. And so we're running late, which takes my stress levels way up. And meanwhile, she's, you know, it's, it's going to be all right. You know, and I'm, I'm kind of stressed about the deal. We're running so late, we had to jump on the golf cart with a little light. A little, I don't know why they put those things there anyways. They go like. <laughs> and so I say, hey, thanks, buddy, so much. And I take off and just run into the gate. And I get down to the gate, and we're running to the wire, and I say, Listen, I'm here from Charlotte, North Carolina. She says, you know, the gate got changed. We'll go all the way down here. So now we take off again. I'm running, and I'm, I'm stressed out. My wife, meanwhile, is, she's smiling. She thinks this is fun, you know. And we go down there, and I pull up to the gate. And you ever been those, met those people that are just not happy about life, not happy about their jobs at all, not happy about anything? She's behind the gate, and, and I pull up, and the sign says Montgomery, Alabama. It does not say Charlotte. I said, is this the gate for Charlotte, North Carolina? i got to go to Charlotte, North Carolina. Is this the gate? She says, yes, it is. I said, well, someone needs to change this sign. The sign says Montgomery, Alabama. You're confusing people. Someone needs to sign. She snatched my ticket and said, and your ticket says 10 p.m., not 10 a.m. Do you know the difference, Mr. Purvis? <laughs> I do. If you need me, I'll be right over there. <laughs> I don't know, for the next 12 hours or so. And so I, I slide over there. Man, I'm sulking. I mean, I'm, can you believe that? Two days, two days, and now I'm going to spend a day in the airport. Now i got one day, and I'm going, good, Greg. You know, that, me and my wife, we, we want to get away. There's some things I want to do you can't do legally in the airport. And I'm going, man, this ain't, you know, this ain't good. And I'm just sulking. Here she comes. Just, it would be all right. She walks over there. She says, you stressing out too much. We can get a flight. Look at all those planes. I said, babe, those planes have schedules. They have agendas. They have places they need to be. No one up there is flying the plane saying, where do you want to go? Where do you want to go? I don't know. It'll be all right. Let's just fly wherever. That's not how the deal works. She said, man, you just stress out. Give me the ticket. I'll go see the guy over here. I'll pray about it. We're going to get a ticket. She comes back. I'm thinking, yeah, right. She's going to get a ticket. Hey, we, we're leaving Charlotte, North Carolina. 15 minutes. Got to change. Told you. It will be all right. I'm like, hmm. You know, I'm mad, but I'm happy at the same time. You know what I mean? I, I just, I envy that. You know, I, that's what Jesus teaches, that you ought to go through anxiety-free, just not worried about a thing. Yet there's people like me and you, so maybe this message is for me and you today, that we worry. Here's some of the negative side effects of worry. One is it ruins your health. It messes with your health. I read a stat uh, recently that says almost 60% of health-related issues come from stress and worry and fear and anxiety. That means this. We're killing ourselves, aren't we, <laughs> by, by worry. I mean, it's amazing, 60%. Worry also steals your peace. Now, here's how it steals your peace, by consuming and tormenting your mind. You're thinking about that thing, you worry, you worry, you worry, and you can't worry and have peace at the same time. You can't worry and have gratitude at the same time. You can't worry and be joyful at the same time. The two cannot coexist, so it steals your peace. It's also an insult to God. We're going to talk about that in just a moment, but it's an insult to God. 
Or we also waste our energy. Every one of us every day are allotted a certain amount of energy to do what we need to do, just like gas in a, in a gas tank. Uh, we can spend it however we want. But worry, if you think about it, is work. Bottom line is worry is work. It steals your energy, and worry takes work. Some of you are realizing now, you're putting two, two together, you're saying, wow, I got two full-time jobs. One I get paid for, and one that steals from me. My health, my peace, my state of mind. That's what worry does. And by the way, worry doesn't work. I just read a stat a while back. That was about a year and a half ago. Look at this. 40% of the things that we worry about will never happen. It's almost 50% right there. 40 will never happen. 30% of the things we worry about are from old decisions that cannot be changed. 12% of the things we worry about are from criticism, most likely untrue, made by people who feel inferior. 10% 10% of the things we worry about relates to health, which worsens while I worry. <laughs> and 8% of the things that we worry about are legitimate, something that I can do something about. So that tallies up, if I'm doing my math right, to 92% of the things that we worry about that we can't do anything about, that will not happen, you know, anyways. That's pretty high. That's the waste of worry. You know, Joyce Meyer says this, say, she says, worry is like putting a down payment on a problem you may or may not ever have. It's true, isn't it? But worry keeps us busy. It's like a rocking chair, but it gets us nowhere, doesn't it? And so let's jump in and see what Jesus says about worry. It's the famous chapter on worry. It's chapter six of Matthew's gospel. And to set the scene up, remember, um, to set the scene up, he, seven of the 12 disciples were fishermen. And seven of the 12, remember they had good jobs, they were doing well, they were doing fine, but they left all and followed Jesus. Over in chapter four, we see John and James. John and James, some of his closest disciples, uh, they were in a family fishing business. And when Jesus came by and called them, they left their father. I mean, the poor dad, he's there, he lost all his employees that day. (laughs) James and John, his own son, leaves and they follow Jesus. And, uh, and so they leave, and then he goes a little bit down the shore in chapter 4. It shows us that he grabs uh, Simon, and he grabs uh, Andrew, and he grabs them, these brothers, and they were also fishermen, making a good living. Doing, they're fine financially, everything's going good. And they leave their boat, leave their nets, leave everything, leave the fishing business to follow Jesus. And so Jesus now takes this time, and he's going to bring them up, and he's going to give what's called the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever, give what's called, where he talks about a bunch of different things, but one of the topics that he talks about is worry, because he knew you and I would deal with this big issue of worry. And he takes them up, and he takes them to this place. I even find the place interesting. We, you've heard of it, you, 930 crowd, you've heard Capernaum. That's the way we, we say it in the South, Capernaum, kind of the redneck way of saying it. The actual way you say it is Kafir Nahum, Kafir Nahum. Now let me show you the, the meaning of this. Kafir comes from the original word. Kafir means village. Nahum means comfort. And so even a spot that he's teaching them is in the village of comfort. Need to me. And so he pulls them over there, and it's around the Sea of Galilee. There's nine different cities, and he pulls them up on this village, Capernaum, the city of comfort, up on this mountain overlooking, and he's about to teach them, guys, you're stressing out a lot. Guys, you're, you're worrying a lot, and I'm about to teach you how you can get through this issue of worry. And he starts off chapter 6, verse 24. Now, you've heard this verse. It says, no one can serve two masters, for they either hate the one And love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now that word mammon there, a lot of times we take this and we say this is just a financial verse. It's it's really not. He's setting up the course of worry today, what we're talking about. The word mammon there means property. It It means money as well. It means possessions. It means stuff. And so before he talks to them about worry, he says, before you saw, before we go into the solution about worry, listen, guys. You can serve God or you can serve stuff. You can depend on God or you can depend on stuff. You can depend on God as your source or stuff as your source, but you cannot do both. You get it, Peter? I know you all left your jobs, James, John. You can depend on God or you can depend on your abilities, your stuff, your product, one or the other, but you can't do both. Then he sets that up, and I imagine the disciples are sitting there and they're thinking, Okay, 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 got you. Got our stuff, got our stuff. That's going to be pretty easy. We left everything. We have no mammon. We have no stuff. So I guess we will choose to serve God. So go ahead. Give us this advice, Jesus. Now Jesus says, move in, move in, move in. I'm going to tell you something profound, okay? Okay, you ready? Here's something profound. I know you're worried about clothes, food, water. I know you're worried about the whole deal. How are you going to pay for stuff? Because now you left your jobs. 
coming in a little closer. So I imagine they, they huddle up. And then he says this, verse 25. Therefore, now anytime in the Bible there's a therefore, he's connecting two points. So he's connecting the verse he just said, can't serve God or stuff. Now he's saying, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, nor about your body and what you will put on. Now here's these disciples leaning in, waiting for some profound advice. They need money. And Peter maybe needs to buy his wife something. You know, their clothes are wearing out. They're hungry. They're thirsty. They're jobless. Give me some advice. And here's Jesus' advice. Just don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about food, water. So just, just don't worry about it. And I don't know, speculation, but I'm guessing the disciples go, huh, I left all my stuff to get that kind of advice. Just don't worry about it. And then he says, listen, listen, listen. Peter, come in a little bit closer. Don't worry about your life. Don't, don't, don't worry about a thing. And I imagine, you know, I don't know, but I imagine them sitting there and, and John is intently listening and Peter's always, the, you know, the loud mouth. And so Peter's sitting there listening and he goes, Psst, hey, hey, John, John, how is your relationship with your old man? Because yeah, I know John and James left their dad on the boat. Peter's a former fisherman. What? What, Peter? Psst, how are you on talking terms with your father? Why? Because we're going to need a job after this sort of advice. Just don't worry about it. And so he's contemplating this deal. And here's what he says, verse 25, the second half of that. He says, is not life more than food and your body more than clothing? The disciples say, yeah, but we kind of need those things. <laughs> kind of need food, kind of need clothing. I kind of need these things. Now he was addressing their, their issues at that time. Our issues today, we didn't show up. None of us showed up hungry or needing clothes or needing water. Our issues were different. If he were here today, you know what he'd say? We, we would be sitting here and we'd be saying, Jesus, I'm worried if I'm going to be able to retire early on time. Jesus, I'm worried about if I can get into that school. Jesus, I'm worried about if I can get my kid into that school that I want them to get into. Jesus, I'm worried about if my son or my daughter, they're going down the wrong road, if they're going to turn out right. Jesus, I'm, I'm worried. I'm 35 years old and I'm worried if I'm going to get married on time. And Jesus would say the same thing he said to them that day. He'd say, don't worry about it. It's not life more than these things. And you say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Jesus, Jesus, you don't understand. If my kid don't get into that school, their life could be a wreck. And Jesus would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know it's important. I know it's important. Is life, is that like the meaning of life? The whole life depends on your kid getting out of school? Well, now you say it that way. But Jesus, I, you don't understand. I, I've been putting him up 401k. I got to retire. I mean, if I don't retire on time, I've been doing this deal the whole life, and they said I could retire on time. Now the economy, you know, that when we hit that little turn back there a while back, you know, it was kind of a downslope. I don't know if I'm still be able to, to retire. And Jesus would say, listen, listen, listen. I know that's important. Is that life? Do you retire early? Is that the meaning of life? Yeah, but Jesus, what about if I don't get married by the time I'm 35, then you know the whole deal. After that, it takes, you know, it's harder to get pregnant, and I want to have babies by the time I'm 36 and a half-ish, and I've got to hurry up and do this thing. Quit, you know, I'm on a timeline, Jesus, and if I don't, you know, I just don't know how things are going to pan out. And he'd say, is that like life, your whole life? Well, Jesus, you don't understand I'm with a divorce, and, and, and I've got kids, and I just want someone to, to, to love my kids like, like uh, you know, I love them, and I, I just need that, and I need that to happen like now. He said, it's, it's legitimate, and, and I know what you need, but listen, is it the meaning of life? Is it life, like life in itself? He said, well... No, I guess it's important, but it's not like whole life. And so he's putting it into perspective. And the disciples are starting to get it. And then he says this. He says, I lean in a little bit closer. Lean in a little bit closer. I want to I share with you something even more profound. Disciples are starting to understand. Let me, let me come in and look at Peter, come in. Look at the birds of the air. Excuse me, Jesus. You were going somewhere, and now you, you mean figuratively or literally? No, 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 Peter, literally. Let's, let's look up at the birds. And I imagine they're all standing there, James John. And now we're looking at the birds. He said, look up, Peter. You see them? Yeah, Lord, I, I see them. And Thomas, the doubter, is going, I knew I doubted him. Left everything. Now I'm looking at birds. And Peter's over here going, Psst, 
John, James, I ask you again, are you on speaking terms with your father? <laughs> we're starting to make sense with the whole is this life thing. Now we're in la-la land, looking at birds. I've still got a pole. Still got a skill, need a job. Meanwhile, here we are, professional fishermen, now bird watchers. And he says, look up, guys, look up, look. Peter, see the birds? Yeah, I see them. You worry about food, you worry about water. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about those things, Lord. Do the birds look skinny? No, they look healthier than me. I mean, I'm not a professional bird watcher. I'm mainly fish, but, you know, since I left the whole deal and followed you now, I guess they look fat to me. They look healthy, they look fine. Peter, you get what I'm saying? The birds don't have a plan. He says, they don't sow nor reap. They don't do none of these things. Do the, do the birds look unhealthy to you, Peter? Well, no, Lord, that, that, they don't look un, unhealthy. They look fine to me. The birds don't have a plan for their children. Do you know what the birds' plan for their children is? Have children, bring the little birds up as high as they can to the highest tree I can find, and then in a few months, pew, they fly or die. That's their plan for their kids. And then it gets cold, I just kind of instinctively go south. Now, Peter, look up. Yes, sir, Lord, I'm looking up. Is there a shortage of birds? No, sir, there's not. Okay. Now, if they don't do anything, they don't try to do the will of God, they don't, they don't try to do any of that, and yet they're fine, I think I can take care of you. And here's what he says, verse 26. They don't sow nor reap, they will gather in their barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Then he asks the question, are you not more than valuable than the birds. And I believe Peter said, okay, I got it. Got where you're going with that. I get it. I totally get it. My bad. Verse 27 says this, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? He's saying worry is a waste. Worry does nothing. I came up with a stat for you. Here's my stat, okay, on worry. Worry has a 100% success rate for never solving any of your problems. Never. Never solves, solves any of your problems. And that's what Jesus says right here. He says, can your worries add a single moment to your life? He was saying, are you worth more than the birds? And in 31, he says, so don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. They dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. He's saying, guys, when you worry, you're acting like an atheist. You're acting like an atheist. Like, this is beyond you, God. I'm, I'm worried. You can't control this. So I'm worried about how this is going to pan out. Or if I knew I could do a better job, but God, this is beyond your ability. When you worry, you're acting like an atheist, an unbeliever, someone that knows, doesn't believe there's any God at all. And he's saying as believers, that's what you're doing, which I find it neat that he was teaching to believers. He was teaching to the disciples that would go out and teach the church. The unbelievers, though, the crowds started listening in. So this word was for the church. The unbelievers started hearing it. Now, that's a word for us. If anybody should not worry about a thing, the church knows our Heavenly Father. We should be the, the most free spirit people. We should be just like Carrie Beth. This is going to be all right. It'll be fine. Because that's who the verse was for. He said, listen, you've got a Heavenly Father. You, you, you should be fine. Don't worry about a thing. Then he says, your heavenly father already knows your needs. Now that to me, besides John 3, 16, is probably the most comforting verse in all the Bible. Your heavenly father already knows your needs. The three things that you wrote down earlier. Look down at them, write that word out. Your heavenly father already knows your needs. Your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Pretty much solves it, doesn't it? God knows my needs. It's not, my problems are not bigger than, than God. God knows exactly where I'm at and what I need when I need it. And so then he goes on and he gives the solution. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he'll give you everything that you need. Now, what he's saying there is he's saying, I'm not saying don't care. I'm not saying go through life with a, a latte and a surfboard and just whatever will be, it will be. He's saying, I want you to plan. I want you to work. I want you to put aside for retirement. I want you to pay off debts. I want you to go on dates if you want to find a mate. Do it. Do all these things. Plan and work for them. But after you've done everything you can do, 
There's got to be a point where you go, God, whatever your will is, outcome's in your hands. Seek first the kingdom of God. Means Remember Jesus' prayer? He said, our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said, whatever your will is, that's what we've got to do. The answer to worry is we're going to do everything we can do about it if we can do something about it. But then you've got to get to the point where you say, God, however you want it to turn out, your will be done, not mine. However you want it to turn out, whatever you want, your will be done, not mine. You see, worry falls up under two categories. Something I can do something about and something I can't do something about. And if I can do something about it, the solution is not to worry. It's to do something about it. <laughs> but if I can't do nothing about it, then I shouldn't worry about it, should I? Because your heavenly Father already knows your needs. And so he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Now, in these scriptures, really quickly in closing, he gives us three very clear ways to solve worry. Number one, worry follows my words. Worry follows my words. Verse 31 clearly says, so don't worry about these things saying. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows what she needs. He's saying, watch your words. Unbelievers say, what are we going to eat? We're worried about this. We're worried about retirement. We're worried about this. We're worried about what we're going to find to make. What are we going to do? He's saying, watch your words because what you say in your words eventually become your thoughts. What you say, what you speak is what you think about. What you speak about is what you think about. Our emotions follow our words. If you don't believe me on that one, start talking about the person that you just despise, that betrayed you, that you can't stand, that did you wrong. Spend 30 minutes of your life just talking about them and see if you don't get mad. You will, won't you? Our words have a way of our feelings follow our words. So don't speak these things. Worry follows my words. Now, the second thing is this. Focus on your father. Focus on your father. Verse 32 clearly says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all of your needs. Where focus goes, energy flows. Where focus goes, energy flows. So if I focus on what I lack, what I worry about, where do you think my energy is going to go? To the things I worry about, what I lack, the things I need. But when I focus on who my father is, just like the song that I told Clint a couple weeks ago, I said, hey, play this song. It's old school, but there's no school like old school, I believe. And so I said, play, play some of that, that song, because that, 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 the words to that, if I, if I look at his face, everything seems to fade away. See, look at who your father is. Focus on your father. If your father was a billionaire, and let's say he was generous, and he was a billionaire, and he said, if you ever run into any financial problems, ever, any hiccups, you come to me. I won't have a problem in the world bailing you out. You know you would never worry about finances. He said, my, my dad's a billionaire. But yet your heavenly father and your heavenly father and your heavenly father and your heavenly father is far more powerful than a billionaire. Look at the names of your father. I listen them up on the screen for us here. Yahweh Shalom. That means the Lord, our peace. Now, when we talked about the different areas we worry about, that solves the family issues, the friend issues, the relationship issues. El Shaddai, that's, that's the mighty one of Jacob, speaks to the ultimate and sovereign power over all. Now, there's the future, isn't it? Hey, your father's name says, I take care of the future. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. Now, there's the clothes issue, the finance issue. It's your very father's name. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord heals. Maybe you got a bad uh, health report. Maybe you're worried about a health report. Say, you know, my father's very name says he's the God, the father that heals. That's my father. And so if he's willing, I'm ready. Heal me. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner. The name has to do with warfare. Now, there you go with your failures, the things you beat yourself up over, the things of sin that you struggle with, the things that maybe you got spiritual warfare going on in your life right now. Your father's very name means I'll take care of it. I'm the God of war too. I'll take care of all that as well. Remember who your father is. Your heavenly father already knows all of your needs. Write this down. Everything over your head is under his feet. Everything over your head is still under his feet. You think about that, you write that down next to that little list of worries you got, psh, puts it in perspective. Everything over your head is under his feet. Number three, value, verify your value. Verify your value. When worry takes care, verify your value. Look at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value? Are you not of more value than they are? Verify your value. 
Now, this is going to be a deep question, okay? We're closing this thing up. This is going to be a deep question. Are you worth more to God than a bird? Yes? Some of you, the answer is yes. Are you worth more? No, some, I'm pretty sure I just saw someone go, I, I'm not sure. I think the way I feel today, I don't know. Is this a trick question? Look, you're worth more than a bird. Let me prove it to you. God sent his son, not a bird, to die for your sins. His only son to die for your sins on a cross so that he could have a relationship with you. He sent, he sent his own son to die for you. You're worth more than a bird. Matter of fact, I'm going to make you say a, a proclamation of faith since some of you doubted this morning, okay? This is going to be deep. You may want to write this on your walls, okay? Say this with me. God loves me, God loves me more, than a bird. more than a bird. One more time. God loves me, God loves me more than a bird. One more time because I want the online audience. God loves me, God loves me more, than a bird. more than a bird. Now, just for a second, I've got to pick on the online audience. If you're sitting in a computer screen by yourself saying, God loves me more than a bird, your children, you're going to have to tell them what this means later. They're thinking, what is, what's wrong with mom? I have no clue. She's looking at the computer screen saying, God loves me more than a bird. <laughs> but he does. And if he takes care of the birds of the air, then he'll take care of me. Dude, dude like we talked about this, this, this week in this story, I've noticed it all week. You see birds chirping, they're flying around. When I pulled in, those birds out there, and it reminded me, I thought, huh, you know, they're neither sow nor reap. They're, they're trying, they ain't trying to do please God. They're not trying to come up with it. They don't have a plan for their kids, none of that. Yet they're still flying. Yet they're still, there's, no, there's not a shortage. God loves you way more than a bird. And so verify your value. The things you wrote down earlier, ask yourself, can my heavenly father take care of them? Your heavenly Father already knows what you need. Now, if you're here today and maybe someone invited you, maybe this is your first time in church, maybe you're watching online, and maybe you've had someone pass away lately, and maybe you slipped into the church this morning and you said, you know, I don't want to verbalize this, but my worry is I saw a loved one pass away or I saw something tragic happen, and in the back of my mind, I wonder, I worry about when this life's over, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to make it to the right place? Did I do enough good things to get to the right place? And how did I even get to that place? And can I tell you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, that's a legitimate worry. But yet you can leave here today or you can turn the computer screen off today and you can know for certain where you'll spend eternity. And all you've got to do is trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ and ask him into your life. Jesus loves you. The greatest love story in all the world is that our father, God, he's holy. He's perfect. Yet we're not. It don't take long to look at us to realize that we have sin in our lives. Our sin separates us from God because he's holy. He's perfect. Yet if he wants to still remain God and he's perfect, he has to do something about the sin problem, doesn't he? He has to. And so he loves us so much that he sent his own son, Jesus, to come on earth, to be all God, all man, to pass all the sins and temptations that we deal with every single day, that we fail at every single day. And Jesus passed them all, never sinned and went to a cross and laid down his life and died as punishment for our sins. Holy God said, I'm going to pour out the wrath of God, the hatred of God for my sins, for your sins, on my own son. And his son, Jesus, said, I'll willingly take it. I'll stand in their place because I love you and I love them. And I know they're destined to hell without me doing this. I, I love them. And he laid his life down for us. In the sight of God, God punished our sins on his own son. Then he went to a grave and he did not remain there. So it separates Christianity from all kind of different other religions. He rose from the grave, hung out for 40 days. It wasn't one of these in and out kind of deals. 40 days, continued to eat and teach. Over 500 people saw him. There's proof behind the resurrection. He did all that so that he could have a personal relationship with you, so that he could forgive you of your sins, and so that he could spend eternal life, all of eternity, with you. He wants that today, but all you've got to do is say, you know what, God, I realize I'm a sinner. I need you to save me. Come into my life and change me. It's as easy as that. So would you bow your heads with me as we go to the Lord in prayer together? Father, thank you so much for your word today on worry, for giving us the outline on how we can live an anxiety-free life. Lord, my prayers at this time is for those who are watching online or for those who are here, that they say, Brent, I want that. I want certainty of knowing when I breathe my last breath here where I'll go. And I want a relationship with Jesus. And I certainly need my sins forgiven. If you want that, simply say this prayer in your heart and you believe on it with everything you've got. Say, Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I cannot save myself. 
I believe that your son Jesus died on a cross for my sins. I believe that your son Jesus rose from the dead. I believe that your son Jesus is Lord. Come into my life today. By faith, I receive your gift. Thank you for saving me. I'll never be ashamed of you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer, that's the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. You get a lot of things wrong in life, but you get that one right. And in the light of eternity, that's the decision that you've got to have right. And you've done that today. Now, I'm going to ask you to take it one more step because everyone Jesus ever calls, he always calls openly and publicly as if he's saying, listen, I saved your soul, but would you be ashamed of me? And so I'm going to ask you in just a moment, when we sing a last worship song, to stand and get up out of your seat and walk down and tell one of these couples, I prayed that prayer, or I gave my life to God today. And we want to get you some information to get you started out right, and we want to, I want to meet you and congratulate you in the back and give you your next steps. And if you're watching online, there's going to be a number at the bottom of the screen. I want to hear from you. That can be your public way of proclaiming that you prayed and asked Christ in your life. But here's how you know that that's you. If you know that's you and you, you prayed that prayer, and you're thinking, Brent, you had me up the whole deal. That was great but I ain't get out of my chair walking down there. That's the Holy Spirit inviting you, saying, listen, I know it's fearful. I know you'll be afraid. I know you've been in church a long time. I know this may be your first time, but I'm calling you. What would you do with it? I would encourage you to move. If God's calling, you don't know how long he's going to call. If he's calling you, you move. So would you stand up and you come if you've given your life to God. Now's your moment. Now's your time. Maybe you're watching me online. Would you text me and let me know? I want to hear from you. God's knocking out the door of your heart. He can do something incredible if you'd allow him. He's knocking out the door of your heart. Why don't you open your heart to him? Give God a chance. You won't regret it. Do more verses. I'd love to see what God can do in your life if you allow him. If you're watching me online, I want to hear from you. Now's your moment. Now's your time. What would you do with it? Some of you are so close to the breakthrough. What would you do with a God that wants to do something incredible in your life? He's offering that to you, but now the ball's in your court. He can do something great in your life if you'd open your heart to him. You come. God's giving you this opportunity, you come. Last couple verses. All right. All mine, if you're watching, I want to hear from you. Hey, thank you for visiting us today. And if this ministry has touched your life in any way, please send us your story to I am at CascadeHills.com. And if you'd like to help support this ministry financially and help us spread the word of Jesus Christ around the world, you can go to CascadeHills.com or our Cascade Hills app and select the Give button. We hope you enjoyed the services today. Tune in next week for another great message.